as supporters of this work, we're very grateful for everyone in the room, for your advocacy and for your commitment to this work. Tonight will be the first unveiling of MCH's policy agenda, and you'll hear about our biggest priorities and how we got to these priorities. This is a long process, but it's really central to our values and who we are as an organization. So thanks for listening to us tonight. Without further ado, I'm going to let us officially get started to kick us off on the unveiling of our policy agenda. I'll turn it over to Rhonda Otteson, Executive Director of MCH. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, thank you for joining us today for the sneak peek of our policy agenda for um, as we go into the 2022 legislative session. And um, as Clara said, I'm executive director of the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless, and I've been with the organization about two years, and we've seen some incredible, incredible momentum um, around the work that we're doing, and we hope to continue that um, in the 2022 legislative session. Um, I'm just going to jump into the content because I know we, uh, we only have 45 minutes, but to stay grounded in the work that we're doing today and what we're talking about, I think it's really important for us to just um, revisit the needs that we have here in Minnesota. Uh, on any given night, about 20,000 children, adults and seniors are experiencing homelessness in Minnesota and about 50,000 people will experience homelessness over this year. About half of the people experiencing homelessness are children ages zero to 17 and youth um, aged 18 to 24. Black, Indigenous, and people of color are significantly overrepresented in, in the homeless population, as well as the LGBTQ population. And homelessness occurs all across our state, um, in metro areas, in suburban areas, and also in rural areas, which is where I live. We know that there's a great need for shelter and homes in Minnesota. In um, 80 of 87 counties, uh, they lack enough shelter uh, beds to meet the need. And in some areas, shelter may be up to 100 miles away or even further. Um, as far as homes go, we know that shelter saves lives and housing ends homelessness. So when we're looking at the stock of homes here in Minnesota, we currently lack over 50,000 homes uh, to house the people we have in Minnesota. And we need to build 300,000 homes by 2030. So that's a really big goal. Um, another um, need that that points to just how deep the need is here in Minnesota, especially for affordable homes, um, is a Section 8 program, which is a federal pro housing assistance program. And those waiting lists to get onto that program range anywhere from a year to 10 years. And in some areas, waiting lists are closed. Um, so that just kind of shows just how deep the needs are here in Minnesota. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish, you know, with you, with our partners, with um, organization, with advocates, with people with lived experience, we've been able to achieve so much. In 2020, um, as the pandemic um, emerged, we had to very quickly shift with our partners um, to some key policy priorities that were really life-saving for many people. The first one was the eviction moratorium. We advocated with Homes for All for that. Um, the second was $26.5 million for the emergency services program. We'll talk about that more later, about the need for that. But that was really critical in providing the staffing, shelter operations, and motel vouchers across the state for communities um, to meet that need, especially as shelters were depopulating and moving some of the most at-risk people into um, motels. Um, and then a five and a half million for the housing supports program, which was a really crucial program um, for people experiencing homelessness. A hundred million dollars for housing assistance, especially for people who are unemployed and couldn't work during that time. And of course, um, like I said before, shelter saves lives, housing ends homelessness, $116 million investment to preserve and create safe and dignified homes across the state. So, um, well, 2020 was an unusual um, and unprecedented year in so many ways, and that's why you'll see that return on investment for every dollar invested in our mission, we helped to return $413 um, in the housing space to address homelessness and create housing stability across the state. So for 2021, um, those policy achievements, we continue to push um, on uh, shelter um, in those operations, as well as um, making those investments in homes. 
um, 12 million for the emergency services program uh, to fund staffing, motel vouchers, street outreach and operations. That's that key source of funding that shelters um, and communities really depend on to create um, safe emergency shelter. Um, a $19 million inc uh, increase in shelter infrastructure improvements. So shelter capital, you'll hear us talk a lot about, but those are investments in the bricks and mortar of creating those new spaces um, because we have a lack of shelter. Um, increased funding for the housing supports program that really serves some of the most at-risk folks. Um, and then a really key policy change to the housing support program Previously, people were only able to be absent for 18 days from their unit. Um, and this policy change made it possible for people to be gone from their unit for more than 18 days. And this really mattered, one, because with the COVID-19 pandemic, people were seeking health care. But if people wanted to seek um, help for mental health treatment or addiction treatment, they weren't able to keep their housing. So this was a really crucial um, change that we were able to achieve with our partners. Um, an, another $10 million federal allegation to the emergency services program. And finally, you know, we need to build and uh, preserve or build and preserve the homes that we have um, and create more homes. So another $100 million investment. So in 2021, um, that return on investment was um, for every dollar invested in our mission, we returned $150 um, uh, to address homelessness and to create homes in Minnesota. So um, we're going to uh, talk next about the policy agenda, but we really work year round to examine the needs of people experiencing homelessness and to work with our member organizations and advocates. Many have lived experience or are currently experiencing homelessness. Um, and we work with them to identify the most pressing needs and to formulate the necessary policy and funding solutions to create housing stability for children, youth, adults, and seniors all across Minnesota. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it out over to Zach Eichton, our policy director, to talk about our policy agenda for 2022. Yeah, thanks, Rhonda. Um, it's, first of all, just so wonderful to have all of you here. I've, I've been just waiting so patiently to be able to finally like talk about this publicly. We put in a lot of time, a lot of energy on developing a really robust policy agenda this year. Um, and the way that we're looking at it is really through the lens of what is, what is an individual's experience as they go from homelessness into permanent housing? Um, and what does that journey look like? Um, how do we look at that in a way that keeps people safe? It's a, it's a short time in homelessness. It's dignified. How do we, um, work towards that goal of you know, quickly getting people out of homelessness. Um, and really to do that, we really look to our community to inform us as we make these decisions on our policy agenda. So the first thing that we wanna talk about is the task force on shelter. I'm sure a lot of you uh, may be aware of what uh, this is, but uh, the task force on shelter was something that was brought originally to the Homes for All Coalition um, from folks with lived experience uh, who, want, who wanted to make the shelter system better um, and actually uh, attend to the needs of folks who are experiencing homelessness. And what ended up happening was there was a bill that was passed establishing this task force on shelter um, that brings together community leaders um, to develop some recommendations that actually work towards strengthening our shelter system and providing the needs uh, that, that folks have. Um, and, and actually addressing some of those needs moving forward. So there's some initial recommendations that come out um, early March of this year, final recommendations coming out in uh, August of this year as well. Uh, we're gonna be supporting that work and working to make our shelter system um, a more welcoming environment for folks. Uh, that said, the next thing that we have on our agenda is actually increasing the availability of shelter. Um, right now, as Rhonda mentioned earlier, 80 of our 87 counties just don't have enough shelter beds to meet the need for their community. Uh, so we did a survey this uh, fall that asked our partners to let us know what their needs were to create the shelters uh, that they feel that they need in their communities. And we got over $90 million worth of um, requests or, or uh you know, uh, RFPs, if you will, um, and we're going to be advocating for 75 million. There was already 15 million uh, that Rhonda, or 19 million that Rhonda mentioned earlier about um, that that's already getting released. So that's uh, approximately the, the remainder is at $75 million. 
Um, and we're going to be working to make sure that this goes everywhere in Minnesota, greater Minnesota, suburbs, and metro areas, because everybody deserves a place to lay their head at night. The next thing that we have on our agenda is actually supporting those shelters that we create. Um, and to do that, the best, most flexible way of doing that is through the emergency services program. Now, ESP is a funding stream that is super flexible. It can be used for a ton of different great things, shelter operations, transportation, child care, medical care, it, a whole bunch of really great things that allows for local providers to come up with local solutions to homelessness. So we know that homelessness looks different in different parts of the state. Sometimes, you know, getting a, a ride to a job interview is what's really needed. Sometimes it's having someone watch your child while you are able to uh, go, go do something else. Um, sometimes it really just is operating a shelter, but what we need is the, the flexibility to actually do that and support the shelters that we have and that we're creating. So an ongoing investment into the uh, emergency services program is going to remain on our agenda going into the 2022 policy session. Uh, the next thing is uh, on our policy agenda is what does the world look like as folks transition from homelessness, they exit homelessness into permanent housing? For a lot of folks, this includes a stop on a time-limited housing program uh, in order to gain some stability and uh, really recenter yourself uh, as you move into a permanent destination. One of the programs that does a really great job of this is the transitional housing program. So what we're gonna be asking for is uh, a $9 million investment as well as some policy changes. So those policy changes that we're going to be looking at is cleaning up the language uh, in that statute to allow for folks to be able to stay on that program from uh, instead of 24 months, which is two years, it seems like a lot, but it's really not enough time for folks to get really established and changing that up to three years so that people feel that there is enough time for them to really get settled back in uh, to the swing of things, get some rental history um, and be able to make a, uh, a good transition into permanent housing. Additionally, there's a $6 million roughly uh, shortfall between requested funds and funds available in this program. We're going to be asking for $9 million so we can cover that shortfall, as well as that extra $3 million so that we can uh, support that increase from 24 to 36 months. Um, we're really excited to be working in this space. Um, transitional housing is something that's desperately needed so that people can transition effectively into permanent destinations. And finally, permanent destinations. Uh, is super critical. We know that shelter saves lives and housing ends homelessness. So we have, are, are going to be advocating along with the Homes for All Coalition. Um, we're super involved in that, if you didn't know. Uh, we have a lot of uh, leaders uh, from that coalition in this call right now. And we're going to be advocating through that coalition for $400 million in housing infrastructure bonds to build more affordable housing, as well as $100 million in general obligation bonds to preserve our public housing stock. Um, we need to do both. We need to build more and preserve the uh, naturally occurring homes that we have in order to fully address our affordable housing shortage. Um, we're going to be advocating for that full continuum along with the uh, Homes for All Coalition. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for being here to support us in that work. We really can't do it without you. Um, and we have a really great agenda because of all of the work uh, in community that we're able to do because of your support as well. So uh, thank you. And from there, I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, Matt Trainer, who is our director of organizing here, to be able to talk about how we got to this really great policy agenda. So over to you, Matt. Thank you, Zach. Um, so um, <clears throat> I want to start out by just saying, like, during non-COVID years, it's a disclaimer for everything, but typically we would be traveling throughout the state and meeting folks where they're at. Uh, so we weren't able to do that as much this year, but we did get sneak a few in before the Delta variant really became even more of an issue. So, um, and I just say that because these, how we did the listening sessions were a little bit different this year. They were still great, uh, but we did do it a little differently. Um, and I also want to say our listening sessions do more than just set our policy agenda. Uh, they really allow us to get grounded in, in the work and make sure we're looking at this as a people solution, not just data sets, right? We need to make sure we have that urgency level as advocates. And the best way to raise that urgency level is by directly talking to folks that are experiencing homelessness. 
And I know there's multiple people that are attending that let us uh, attend and talk to some of the uh, folks that you're with. So thank you for that. But I also want to read a couple of these quotes to just show how it does ground us in our work. Uh, the first one is, I hope someone listens because this is not working. I waited so long for my family to get help. The other one is, I wish everyone could understand what it's like to be without a home for my kids. For good parents, there just isn't help. Our listening sessions, we uh, did do uh, uh, six events that were specifically for folks with lived experience. Uh, and then we did uh, 19 different groups. We did a lot this year. Um, we, uh, it was a full team effort. Uh, we met with 19 groups comprised of advocates, service providers, and other key stakeholders. And then we also uh, did some outreach through surveys to our membership base. And we had 27 of those that we compiled. Once we got the results from the listening session, we compiled it, developed common themes. But in order for anything to make it onto our agenda, it had to have at least been mentioned by the uh, listening sessions that were from folks with lived experience. So that was our starting point. And then we compared it to the input from other groups. And if it wasn't on the listening session from folks with lived experience, it did not make the cut. So we did that. And then we also had like a little core committee of folks with lived experience that helped us narrow it down from a really big list down to what you see on our legislative agenda. So I just wanted to point that out that we prioritize lived experience and we want to make sure we're talking to the folks that are doing the work day in and day out as well. I'm going to talk about each agenda item, but not what it is, because Zach just did that, but I'm going to talk about what we heard, and that's why it's on our agenda. So the task force on shelter, so we heard that there needs to be more protections, more guidelines to ensure that shelters are providing a dignified and safe environment for the residents. So we obviously heard that from folks that were actually accessing the shelters, but we heard that from staff of shelters as well that people can think that can be a rub sometime from folks with lived experience and staff, but everybody that's either staying in shelter, working at a shelter, wants better, wants more, but we also know we need more resources for some of the things that need to happen. And that task force on shelter with the report will highlight some of the needs as well. So we just really wanna support that task force on shelter. Um, the next item for shelter capital, uh, no matter where we were, even pre-COVID, this has been our, on our agenda for multiple years. So no matter where we were, we heard the need, we need more. But something that doesn't always get mentioned is we also heard we need more culturally specific uh, shelters that allow for different family statuses. They need to be low barrier uh, for different parts of the state based on geographic location. What they need to do can look different versus what it looks like in other parts. Uh, the 15 million for the emergency services program. Again, that's kind of echoing that uh, folks staying in shelter said they wish they had more time with their caseworkers. They wish they could have accessed a caseworker faster. They wish there would have been more outreach to get them to the shelter so they knew about it. And then also staff just saying they wish they had more staff to work with to make sure they could meet the needs of everybody in the shelter. Um, transitional housing, this has really been coming up more and more over these last few years. And I'm sure it's because of the housing stock, rent increases, all that. And we know permanent housing is the ultimate solution, but until we have enough of that, we need more time limited housing. But then it, as we talk to more people, there's also a need for different programs that don't require intensive supports. And that's something like transitional housing can do is there's a variety of services that can be offered, but we wanna make sure there's an option for folks that just need a temporary pit stop until they get to their own place. And transitional housing really fills that need of being able to just take time, relax and figure out their next steps. And then I think the most self-explanatory one, the 500 million bonds for housing, no matter again where we were, there's not enough affordable housing or the public housing that's there isn't in the greatest of conditions. So we know we need more money to develop housing and to fix a public housing that we have. Keep in mind domestic violence shelters as well. That's an eligible use, youth shelters as well. So it's not just 
a lot of times people think of shelters just congregate shelters, but shelter capital is much more than that. And different communities can get really creative with it. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Zach, for walking us through all of that good information. As I'm sure you all just heard along with me, our community partners and folks with firsthand experiences of homelessness and those perspectives are those are the perspectives that we really strive to strive to amplify, uplift, and honor in our work. So as you heard, partners are a key part of making this happen and making those connections. And with that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mary Westland, the Executive Director of New Pathways in Cambridge, Minnesota. New Pathways serves five counties in central Minnesota and has the mission to build a stronger community by providing shelter and support services to family with families with children experiencing homelessness. Mary, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Clara, for this opportunity. Um, New Pathways is again in Isani County, which is in central Minnesota. Um, we have two programs. Our Path to Home program is a shelter. We partner with area churches to provide the shelter at night along with the meals. And then we provide the day shelter and the services. We serve five families at a time through that program. We are the only shelter program for families in Region 7E, which is a five county service area. And on average, every year, we turn away double than what we're able to serve in that shelter. Our other program is a supportive housing program. And our goal there is to increase stability. We serve 12 households right now through that program. And on average, we have zero to one openings a year. So not a lot of transition, but that's the, that's what we plan to do. But it also doesn't give new families opportunities to enter that program very often. So our shelter program, Path to Home, back in March of 2020, when the pandemic started to hit Minnesota, really had a hardship. Um, all of our churches closed. Therefore, we didn't have night shelter. So we transitioned into a hotel model and we started with one week of funding. So it went week to week for a while and that was really nerve wracking. And then finally the COVID relief dollars were released and then we were able to go month to month, which still was scary, but better. And then finally we secured um, longer term funding which is now gonna bring us through September of 2022, which takes us out of being reactive and proactive. Um, which has been great. And I just wanna be really clear, without that money, our shelter would have closed. So we are so very grateful for that money. Um, and the families that we served, I know is grateful as well. Um, so we have been looking at longer term solutions for our shelter program, what would be best. And what we identified is we need to transition to a site-based 24 hour shelter program and we have been working towards that. And we were so excited that the acquisition grant that is out right now for RFP was released. Um, we were able to find a property. Um, the city of Cambridge was being very gracious and accommodating. We had an attorney, we had a contractor, everything was good to go. We were ready to apply for this money and the seller accepted another offer. And now we're stuck. We're not able to apply for the acquisition funding that is available now. So we sincerely hope in the near future, there is acquisition money or capital funding to help programs like ours um, sustain because our churches are reporting that they're struggling. Church doesn't look normal yet. And a lot of their volunteers are not coming back. So I don't know if we're gonna be able to put that program back online. Um, and our supportive housing program, this last summer, um, we're funded by one funding source and they received a significant cut in central Minnesota, which then trickled down to us. And it basically was a 38% cut to our support service budget quite abruptly. Um, and we're still trying to recover from that. Um, fundraising is very difficult right now, but we're working on it. Um, I'm applying for any grant possible, but what is happening is foundations and grants that are available are quite competitive. And then we're just not able to access um, some of the larger foundations, like for example, the Target Foundation, they are very generous and they, they support many, many programs and gives out thousands of dollars. 
but I can access a $50 gift card or maybe up to $1,000 in funding. So there's just, there's funding out there, but not always obtainable. So we rely a lot on state funding to run our programs. Um, so those are some of the barriers we face as an agency. And I met last week with our case managers to discuss some barriers our families are experiencing. And we've identified transportation and the ability to access services. There's many, many miles between needs and services to meet those needs. And even if a family has transportation, they may not have the gas money or they may not have a vehicle that works well. Um, so there's a lot of difficulties around that. And families also have, they may have difficulty or limited ability to contact service providers, whether they, they might not have a phone that has internet or really good service. And I experienced that over the weekend. I was up north and I had absolutely no internet service and very shoddy cell service. And if I needed to do a virtual appointment with a doctor, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, cell phones are a lifeline for those that are unhoused. And sometimes they're not the best ones because they just don't work <laughs> like we need them to. And then our community really needs subsidized housing that's based on income. Um, that would be the best fit for the families we are serving because um, we really lack livable wage jobs. There's a big gap between housing and wages that families often fall through. So um, that gives you a glimpse, I guess, of what keeps me up at night and the problems that I'm trying to solve in our community. And I just really thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your willingness to listen. Thank you, Mary. We so appreciate you being here this evening and we're honored to be in this work with you. Um, to talk more about some firsthand experience with shelter in the Twin Cities metro area, we'll welcome our next speaker. Our next speaker is Comfort Dondo. Um, and Comfort is, a founder, is the founder of Pumalani, which is an organization on a mission to stop violence and abuse of women and children in the African immigrant community. Pumalani seeks to disrupt that cycle of gender-based violence. Comfort has experienced homelessness herself and has recently become a multi-property owner who will seek to make these properties more welcoming to folks who experience barriers to housing. Comfort, thank you again for being here today and for sharing your story. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, so for African immigrant women like myself, whom for over five years, um, I found myself in, do, in a domestic violence, over five years ago, I found myself in a domestic violence shelter with my three children, uh, twin toddlers, and, um, and their son who was seven at that time. Um, I soon realized um, the observation I made in that moment was there was a lack of cultural specificity um, in the way the, the services were provided. Um, it was a journey that would take me on a path um, that I would um, later on research on my master's thesis pro uh, project on why a lot of African immigrant women did not stay in shelter. I would learn of the peculiar challenges that women in my community face when fleeing violence. For instance, the average African woman um, has more than three to four children. And then she has an additional three to four that are um, from cousins or an, a, a nephew or a niece who probably passed in war that she's taking care of. So it, makes it, it made it challenging for them to leave the abuse because they have all these children and usually it makes it hard for them to be eligible for mainstream shelter. This then leads the women to choosing danger, uh, endangering their own lives, going back to the abuser, over, um, you know, over staying in domestic violence shelter because they cannot separate the children. I, like the women I currently serve right now, face um, faced some of those challenges and more, being homeless for over a decade. Um, you see, in a, despite the strong quality network of uh, service providers in Minnesota, um, we have um, a, a lack we have the lack of cultural specificity in terms of um, domestic violence programs. Um, and I'll speak specifically for the black community. We are often lumped up, even in research, we are lumped up as just black as monolithic, but we come with different, um, um, you know, we come with different um, challenges. African immigrants, we have peculiar challenges compared to let's say Africans who were born here. And so they, we realized that there was a lack in that. For example, African-Americans comprise of 12%, um, of the Hennepin County residents, 
yet DAP, one of the most amazing service providers um, advocacy, they have um, at least 43% of African Americans. These numbers are proof that there's a disproportionate need within some historically marginalized community. According to the 2020 uh, American Community Survey, about one in five Minnesotans um, um, are African. Of the 50 states, Minnesota has the ninth largest um, population of the African immigrants. Um, and so about 60% come from East Africa, nations, Somalia, Ethiopia, 25% from West Africa, and the rest from other Southern regions or Central Africa. We have a large population here in Africa. Um, and although there's a clear need of the cultural specific programs and those gaps, we still have, we still do not have enough resources for the African immigrant community and, and, and programs that offer culturally specific programs uh, for, for women fleeing abuse. Um, I often um, realize that in my experience, um, one of the barriers was the red taping that was always put when I tried to access services. For example, I'll give you a story. When I was doing my master's, I did not look like the stereotypical um, individual who might have been facing homelessness. I was pursuing my master's of public affairs at the Humphrey. And yet when I applied for apartments, for example, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't get into an apartment because um, of some barriers and some challenges that I had faced because of my mental health and also the domestic abuse. So having shared this story, um, I want to say that um, I, my story changed when I had a good Samaritan uh, re remind me of my dignity and respect, which is why I wanted to share tonight that um, I think we, some of the recommendation is to always think about the dignity and respect of those facing or experiencing homelessness. I would like to recommend that following my story, if a woman like myself four years ago was homeless and now own multiple properties and actually providing housing for women and children in, in my community, um, if we could do that for more people, it would, it would make a significant impact. Um, I want to say second chance works. People transform when given the right tools, especially dignity and respect as the center. They can rise above the challenges, I am proof. Community and survivors of homelessness centered policies, we need um, community centered and survivor led policies that are practical to the community. Because I experience homelessness and sometimes I would go through a shelter system and I'm like, who made these rules? They're not making any sense to me. And so I think we have to really look and evaluate the red taping that happens with some of the programming, ensure that we're putting survivors in the middle first. I also want to encourage funding uh, that offers, a that offers um, opportunities for historically underserved communities. And I wanna say as my my, my colleague, Miss um, Westland um, shared, she's, I think she's in rural Minnesota. So I wanna say historically marginalized and also those in the rural, uh, because those communities do have their own solutions that are peculiar to them. And in ending, I want to say, um, getting rid of um, homelessness is possible because I come from a place and a country and a continent where there's not, um, enough resources or democracy. And I believe that in Minnesota, it's possible. And thank you so much for giving me time. Uh, and again, I repeat, I am proof. I cannot believe that four years ago, I was living out of my car, storage units and cheap motels. One person believed in me and gave me a place to start afresh. And I hope that uh, collectively as a state, we can do that for, 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 for the, those communities that are mostly impacted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Comfort. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your story, your perspective. We are very excited to amplify your mission and know that our shared vision towards ending homelessness is stronger because of the work of both you and Mary. So thanks to both of you for being here. Thank you, Claire. And thank you um, to Mary and Comfort for sharing your perspective, what you're seeing in your community. Um, and just the need for shelter and for the resources in our community that are culturally specific, um, that are um, tailored to community needs. And um, we are all about amplifying uh, the voices of people with lived experience and people all across the state um, who bring the solutions. Um, now, when we build a movement together, we can bring the resources to ensure that we can end homelessness and ensure housing stability across Minnesota. And so we want to invite you to advocate, advocate with us this upcoming legislative session. 
Um, please mark your calendar for vir the virtual Homeless Day on the Hill, which will be kicking off on March 9th um, with the program and, of course, uh, visits with our legislators. Um, I know some of you um, I'm seeing on, on the Zoom call um, have advocated with us for years um, on our, our policy priorities, and I wish we could gather together um, because uh, Homeless Day on the Hill is just an incredible energy builder. Um, but we're going to build out energy online again this year. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that. Um, you'll see some emails uh, from us about how to get um, signed up for that. And if you go to the next slide, um, we also have additional advocacy opportunities. If you're on social media, please follow us um, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, We'll have a Twitter storm or tweet chat during virtual homeless day on the hill and also we partner with homes for all to build energy around housing um, and all those shared priorities that we have. Um, you know the relationship building with your legislator we tie that in with virtual homeless day on the hill but that's really critical again we need. Um, we're nonpartisan. We need Republicans. We need Democrats. We need everybody working together to um, help secure the policy and funding solutions that we know work. Um, and so when we have a movement and advocates all across the state with those relationships with their legislator, um, we can get those wins at the legislature. Um, you know, um, if you're, I'm sure you're on our e-news, that's probably how you got connected here. Um, and so watch that for our announcements on getting signed up for a virtual homeless day on the Hill and also our action alerts throughout the session. We have um, an online software that makes it really easy um, to send, um, for example, an email to your legislator. Uh, you can join in with Homes for All. There's always room for folks on those teams. And on our website, we have a Be Informed uh, tab. So um, www.mnhomelesscoalition.org. Um, there's a wealth of information on our website. And so, um, you know, as we kind of transition um, back um, into the Q&A, um, I just want to thank everybody again for being here. And we're really excited for this upcoming session um, and what we can achieve together with your help.